La próxima charrada será a cargo de Sergei Koslov y porta por título Computational Chemistry for Nano Structuring Effects in Heterogeneous Catalysis. Yes. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to continue the topic of computational chemistry, but I will talk about its applications for catalysis. And first, I will remind you what heterogeneous catalysis is. So a catalyst is a special ingredient you add to your chemical reaction to make it some millions times faster. And in the case of heterogeneous catalysis, what first happens is uh, your reactants absorb on the surface of your catalyst, then they react, then they desorb. So for this process to be successful, your catalyst should have a lot of surface. And as for other objects, surface of a catalyst is proportionate to the, its linear size in the power of two, and the volume of the catalyst or its mass is proportionate to its linear size in the power of three. So high surface to volume ratios you can get only for very tiny small catalysts, which means that in industrial catalysts you have nanoparticles of around three to 10 nanometers in size, which consist of 1,000 or 100,000 atoms. So that's how they look like in experiments when you measure them with transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, or uh, that's how they look like in X-ray reciprocal space mapping, which is probably the most accurate techniques. But as you can see, these uh, techniques do not give you a full picture of what's going on. In contrast, when we do modeling, we know exactly where each atom is located in our model. So here, for example, it's uh, hydrogen absorbed on palladium nanoparticles supported on MGO. And to calculate chemical properties of the system, we need to account for all the quantum effects, so we can either try to calculate wave function. So for this model of around 400 atoms, which has around 2,000 valence electrons, the wave function will have around 8,000 variables, which is pretty complicated, but at least we know that this wave function is governed by Schrodinger equation, we can try to solve it. Alternative approach is to use density functional theory. In this case, we calculate only a function of four variables, electron density, but we don't really know accurately the equations for this function. But these methods are also accurate and they are orders of magnitude faster than wave function based methods. But even with these methods, we can calculate systems of around 400 atoms. Experimental systems are like 100 times bigger, but luckily the properties of nanoparticles seem to depend linearly on inverse radius of the nanoparticles uh, like intraatomic distances in them or positions of Dibbons center in densities of states. For more chemical properties, the behavior is more complicated. Basically, for example, CO absorption energies fluctuate strongly at small nanoparticle sizes, but when your nanoparticles are bigger than 100 atoms, they start to beha behave smoothly. So, which allows us to do our calculations of nanoparticles of around 100 atoms and then to extrapolate our results to much bigger experimentally observed nanoparticles. So that's an example of what we are doing. For example, there were some experiments where they saw that hydrogen absorbs few nanometers deep into palladium nanoparticles, but does not absorb into palladium single crystals at these pressures. And to do these experiments, it was sufficient to irradiate your samples with nuclei of nitrogen, cause a nuclear reaction, and collect gamma radiation emerging. So for chemists, that's pretty complicated. And what we did calculate, we calculated hydrogen absorption energies in crystals and nanoparticles of palladium. And you can see that in crystals, these absorption energies are negative, which means this will not happen at low pressures. In nanoparticles, with bare surface, they are also negative, but when there is a hydrogen covering the surface of nanoparticle, hydrogen absorption energy becomes positive, which makes this uh, absorption process possible at low pressures. So not only we reproduce the results of quite complicated experiment, we also got some new insight uh, on the processes in this system. And as a conclusion, I will summarize the advantages of disadvantages of modeling and chemistry. In general, it's quite cheap and easy when you don't have to develop your own software for this. It gives you precise knowledge of the atomic structure in your models, and also we can study very short-lived systems. As a disadvantage, of course, we have issue of accuracy. In our case, accuracy is enough for science, but is not enough to build a chemical reaction reactor based on our values. 
And also, we still don't know the exact arrangement of items in experiments, so maybe we create models that do not represent experimental situation exactly. So, thank you. <laughs>